March 7, 1965, five to six hundred civil rights activists attempted to march from Selma, Alabama to the state capitol in Montgomery. They marched because activist Jimmy Lee Jackson was murdered by an Alabama state, state trooper on February 26th. They marched because black voters had been effectively disenfranchised through voter suppression. They marched to end the repressive racial segregation of Jim Crow laws. In order for them to march from Selma to Montgomery, they would need to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge. It was there that they were met by law enforcement officers and a band of angry and undertrained local citizens. The sheriff had called for all white men above the age of 21 to report to the courthouse to be deputized that day. The events that followed were horrific. The crowd was charged by troops on horseback. Tear gas was fired. They were beaten with billy clubs and fists. About 17 of the protesters were hospitalized and another 50 were treated for lesser injuries. Because of that violence, the day was known as Bloody Sunday. And it should be noted, it is not the same Bloody Sunday referenced in the U2 song that we just heard. However, the events share many of the same political and social dynamics of an oppressed people being brutalized at the hands of the state. Images of the American Bloody Sunday were published on the front pages of newspapers televised that brought some of the first national press coverage of the civil rights movement. And the next day, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. issued a call for clergy and other people of faith to come to Selma. That included a telegram to the Unitarian Universalist Association asking for support. And by Tuesday, 45 Unitarian Universalist ministers and 15 lay people arrived in Selma, along with many other people from a spectrum of faiths. It was called Turnaround Tuesday. One of those people was Unitarian Universalist minister James Reed. Growing up, Reed and his family had moved often following his father's career. When he was in high school, the family settled in Casper, Wyoming. Jim Reed had been a sickly child, suffering from several respiratory illnesses. He was born with cross eyes, a condition that was not corrected until he was in high school. He wore glasses from the age of 18 months. You can still see in his, his picture that's on the front of your order of the service that kind of stayed that way. In high school, he developed strong social ideals like many of us do. He became particularly concerned with the plight of the poor. He was a leader in his high school's reserve officers training for ROTC. He was a leader in the boys club and in his church's youth group. And doesn't that already sound like the background story of a hero? After a brief stint in the military, James Reeve married and he began his undergraduate education, starting first in community college and going on from there. In 1950, he began training for the Presbyterian ministry by attending Princeton Theological Seminary, graduated in 53, and he still felt compelled to focus on the needs of the most vulnerable. And he pursued hospital chaplaincy and pastoral counseling rather than parish ministry. During this time, dealing with such trauma, suffering, tragedy, his religious perspective shifted and became more liberal and moved beyond the faith of his childhood. In 1956, he wrote, I have clearly progressed in my views until I am much more of a humanist than a deist or a theist. A friend gave him a copy of Today's Children and Yesterday's Heritage. This is the landmark book by Sophia Lyon Fawes describing how she revolutionized religious education in the American Unitarian Association. 
Interestingly, Foz also came out of the Presbyterian Church, as I suppose all of the most outstanding Unitarian Universalists do. <laughs> <laughs> he resigned his Presbyterian chaplaincy and he sought a transfer of his fellowship to Unitarianism. The process took several years, after which he took a position at All Souls Church in Washington, D.C. This was and remains one of our largest and most racially diverse congregations. Reed served as an assistant minister and then an associate minister from 1959 to 1963. During that time, the American Unitarian Association and the Universalist General Convention merged to form the Unitarian Universalist Association. Reed remained committed to what we now call social justice. He worked with many community groups, including the Conference on Committee Relations, Parents Without Partners, the Committee on Citizens Housing, the University Neighborhoods Council, that doesn't sound like a lot, but those were radical organizations at the time, incredibly liberal, doing unique work that nobody else was doing. He was also a leader in local denominational work. He remained committed to Unitarianism and Unitarian Universalism despite all the change and upheaval that was happening. And eventually, he felt it was time to move on from all souls, and he hoped that he could find a racially integrated congregation of his own. But when that wasn't possible, because there weren't enough of them, he took a position with the American Friends Service Committee, and he and his family moved to the Boston area. He joined Arlington Street Church, which at the time was a hotbed of racial justice activity. Although he was not serving a UU ministry, he was still involved in the UUA, and he joined the Commission on Religion and Race, which we heard a little bit about a few weeks ago. And then came the call to Selma. After the horrifying events of Bloody Sunday, about 2,500 people assembled on Tuesday to cross that bridge. They were denied again. They returned to Brown's Chapel to plan and sing and rally. Later that day, Reeve and two other UU ministers went to a restaurant in that black neighborhood for dinner. As the three ministers walked back to Brown's chapel, they accidentally strayed into a white neighborhood. They were brutally attacked as race traders. James Reed was struck in the head with a blunt object. His injury was so severe that he required a neurosurgeon, but a lethal combination of the segregated nature of Selma and the series of ambulance vehicular malfunctions and ill-equipped hospitals prevented him from receiving the care that he needed in a timely fashion. James Reed died on Thursday, March 11th, 1965. His memorial service was held on the 15th and featured the eulogy by Dr. King that we heard earlier. When James Reeve applied for Unitarian Ministerial Fellowship, he wrote, I want to participate in the continuous creation of a vision that will inspire our people to noble and courageous living. I want to share actively in the adventure of trying to forge a spiritual tie that will bind mankind together in brotherhood and peace. And that is exactly what he did. That is what he gave his life for. James Reeve was the first white man to die in the civil rights movement. And his death caught attention in a way that Jimmy Lee Jackson's did not. On the night of Reeve's memorial service, President Lyndon B. Johnson spoke to a joint session of Congress and he asked them to ban the practices that obstruct people from voting on the basis of their race. That later became the 
the Voting Rights Act, which passed in August of that year. The impact of national scrutiny and political pressure also forced local law enforcement to change their tactics when dealing with the demonstrators. A third march was held on March 24th, and on this attempt, the demonstrators were able to cross the bridge and make it to the Capitol. When we talk about James Reed, we must mention Jimmy Lee Jackson. And we also need to honor another Unitarian Universalist who gave her life in Selma. Viola Liazzo was murdered by white supremacists on Selma, in Selma on March 25th, which was the day after the successful crossing of the bridge. She was inspired to go to Selma after attending a service honoring James Reed at her home congregation, the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Detroit. She was a 39-year-old mother of five. Reed and Liazzo are remembered as martyrs to Unitarian Universalist values. In our time, Unitarian Universalists are proud and deeply committed to social justice work. It is well known in this congregation that I like to balance the notion of social justice defines who we are with actual theology. I feel also compelled to balance ideas of we are so good at social justice of examples when we're not. I think that it's important to interrogate our ideas of who we are and our track record for two reasons. One, uh, triumphalism is repulsive and it is damaging to any cause, especially a religious cause. And two, perhaps more importantly, I don't want us to become complacent. We cannot hold up the memory of James Reed and claim that we have won some victory for all time. James Reed got justice work right. He was committed to justice causes throughout his life in every capacity that he served. He was dedicated in a way that few of us can be. He literally laid down his life to do what he felt was right. And we should proclaim that legacy, but we cannot claim it. The nation was shocked by the death of this unassuming young white man who had left his wife and his four children at home in order to put himself in harm's way on behalf of the downtrodden. They could no longer pretend that they did not know what was happening in the South. They could no longer claim that that oppression had nothing to do with them, regardless of where they lived. Some of the people who heard the story of James Reed were compelled to action, just like Viola Liazzo. More white people began participating in these marches and other demonstrations. They went to Selma. They pressured their elected officials to pass that Voting Rights Act. They formed committees and activist groups in support of civil rights because they were inspired. The death of James Reed was a catalyst for white people to become involved in the civil rights movement. Let it be a catalyst for our involvement in our political system and injustice work too. Racism is not over. Oppression is not over. Voter suppression is not over. During his eulogy for James Reed, Dr. King said the cause of his death was an indifferent ministry an irrelevant church, irresponsible politicians, law enforcement embracing lawlessness in the name of law, a timid federal government. That sounds like it could have been written yesterday. Now, I haven't been around long 
long enough to know that either these institutions have slipped back into those states or they have never changed. I suspect that they never changed, but pretended to. That institutional dysfunction is still very present. The so is Dr. Keene's call to Selma. So is James Reed's faithful answer. They echo down to us through the decades. This country, we, you and I, cannot afford institutions that are indifferent, irrelevant, irresponsible, lawless, or timid. We have seen where that leads. Perhaps we are not personally responsible for our institutions being in disarray, but we are responsible for reclaiming them. This coming Tuesday is the Michigan presidential primary. This may not feel like the most important election, but it is just the first in a series of many elections, possibly four, coming up this year. Voting on Tuesday will put us in the habit of voting in the future, and it will build momentum for us to vote in those other elections. Jimmy Lee Jackson, James Reed, Viola Liazzo, they gave their lives fighting to extend voting rights to all Americans. And we owe it to them not to take that right for granted. Holding our government and our institutions accountable, no matter how wild and out of control they are, is necessary. It is our responsibility. It is our right. It can be an overwhelming task. But we know the power of doing the right thing just one step at a time. Our comfort can lull us into believing that everything is fine, that the suffering of others is not our concern. But we know that we are held in an inescapable network of mutuality. It is easy to point to previous successes and say that our work is done. But we know that as long as one voice is unheard, that work continues. Nobody else's responsibility besides ours. So let us honor the legacy and the resilience of our Unitarian Universalist freedom fighters to reclaim the accountability of American institutions. They were not daunted by the difficulties they faced. They were not daunted by the death of their beloved colleagues. So why should we be? In this year of elections and anxieties, let us stay engaged, alert, focused. You gotta vote. Vote every chance that you get. Vote your, con your conscience. And vote your Unitarian Universalist values. May it be so. Amen. And blessed be.